Again, Philippians chapter 2. And again, verse 5, when he says, Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. And, and notice that he doesn't say, Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ, but which was in Christ. Okay. Uh, um, now, again, those little phraseologies are really, really important. I mean, if, if we want to hear what is really trying to be communicated to us, and a lot of times we, we read stuff, but the truth isn't communicated because we read it the way we think it's saying it instead of what it's saying. <clears throat> um, he's saying, let this mind be in you which was in Christ who, and then he, he describes the cross. Okay. My thought is, is that the same mind that is in him right now seated on the throne, well, he's the lamb, lamb slain seated on the throne, so it is the same mind. But why would he say which was in Christ? Because he is trying to show us that the Jesus that we need to know, the Jesus that we need to comprehend, not just what was the, is the Jesus on the cross, not just the cross that Jesus died on and the benefits that it has brought to us. Yes, we, most of us know that. I mean, there's not a you know, whole lot that we could cover here that you probably hadn't already heard, though we will. <laughs> but, but this isn't talking, again, this isn't talking about the benefits to us. <clears throat> this is trying to get us to see that uh, in verse 1 through 4, there are divisions and there are problems going on in, the, in this Philippian church. <clears throat> and, um, and Paul's approach is to, is to point them to Christ crucified, not just Jesus. I mean, I, I want you to think about this now. I mean, a lot of pastors or churches or whatever teachings would say, well, we just need to look to Jesus. But what they mean is, is we, you know, that the one sitting up on the throne and he's going he's gonna to throw down something that'll help or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, he doesn't say that. And that's, that's, that's big to me because I'm a pastor. And I don't want to just say what we say. I want to say what God says. And I, I'm sure I'm, there's still so many areas I need to grow in. But the ones that I have laid hold on, I want to be true, and I want to be true to the Lord. And he is, you know, uh, I mean, this he's writing to the Philippians. You know, we read the book Philippians, and then we say he's writing to the Philippians. But if you consider sort of a little bit of the history there in Acts 16, where Paul and Silas come there, and... You know, they go into the synagogue and they're they're preaching, and then they I think they even take it out on the street somewhat, and and then a bunch of the people get upset with them because Philippi was a a Roman colony. It was like the way that it worked back then was it was a Roman city, uh, and therefore it was Rome. That's the way they looked at it. this is Rome, and these were Roman citizens, <clears throat> and so you can you. I'm sure you've read it many times, Acts 16, and they begin to get upset and they say, well, this, these Jews are coming in here and teaching something contrary to what we're supposed to believe, which is that Caesar is God and that Rome is all what it's about and all this stuff. Well, the truth is, I mean, yes, Paul and Silas were Jewish, but they weren't teaching the old covenant. They were teaching Christ. You know, they were teaching Christ. They never tried to clarify that. They never went, wait a minute, we're not, you know what I mean? And well, like we always try to do, well, if you're going to falsely accuse me, we need to straighten this out. That mind doesn't even go that direction. Who, you know, um, uh, who, what does it say in uh, Isaiah 53 that was dumb before his shears? You know, he's, he spoke not a word, whatever, the wording there is that he's not justifying himself while they're shearing him. Um, <clears throat> that's not easy, but it's glorious when it is Christ in you and, and then and can be lived. It is glorious. 
It is because, and and you actually don't feel any need to to correct their view and anything because that doesn't change what you're here for. Do you understand? I mean, it doesn't change what you're here for. You know, um, <clears throat> it only affects you when. Well, I don't want them to put me in a bad light. I mean, I'm not really here for the Jews. I'm a, I'm declaring Christ, and you know, I shouldn't be persecuted. Well, you know. You're declaring Christ, but you don't want to live Christ. <laughs> you understand what I mean? I mean that you don't. Or how about this? You want to declare Christ, but you don't want this mind in you. You know. <clears throat> so anyway, they pull them, Paul, Paul and Silas out, and then they drag them through the middle of the city, and they make this big uproar, and they drag them to the magistrates, and the whole city is just like in this uproar, and they're just going, ah, you know, and, and what is that doing? That's giving you a little bit of an idea. I mean, it, it says the whole city, I mean, they're just like, this? and they're just, you know, and all this stuff, you know, and, and, um, uh, and it gives you a little bit of idea of sort of the spirit and attitude and ways of the Philippians, this book. The people, the, to the church of Philippi. Man, you just, get, you just bring up a false accusation and they'll all jump on you. Hello? All right. So, Paul starts off and he says, look, if, there's, if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, and, and again, it's from last time that I taught this, I believe that, that he's talking to them. Look, if you have experienced any consolation, any counsel and covering in Christ, if you have received any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any um, uh, tender mercies that you've received from, from the Lord, any compassions, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, that you be that way towards others. If you've got that from Christ, be that way towards others. You know, I mean, I don't know what I thought that said before, but, you know, but every one of the scriptures I get wrong until the Holy Spirit <laughs> breathes on me. I mean, I, <clears throat> so, so, um, and then he's, um, Fulfill you, my joy, that you be like mine, having the same love that you receive. He says, if there's any uh, comfort of love, that you have the same love, and he's talking about towards others. Um, same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. And then, and then he begins to describe his version of, lowliness of mind esteeming others better than yourself um, I think I can find it and you won't have to turn there but uh, scripture that means a lot to me in Romans is uh, Well, it says basically the same thing here. I mean, it's really saying the same thing. Um, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. <clears throat> Golly. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. That, I'm gonna say it, get ready. That doesn't sound Christian to me. And here's what I mean by that. Get out, you know, you, yeah, here's a youth pastor. You kids, get up, we're gonna go take the world. We're gonna change the world. We're gonna do, you know. And, you know, we're going to witness, come, you know, Saturday night, we're going to take the streets of our city, and we're going to go get them, baby. <clears throat> and then I remember this. I remember the thought, and I've shared it with a few of you who've been here long enough, but where. 
I was, uh, I think I was in Bible school and we were talking about world evangelization. And people were talking about their method of world evangelization and we were just on the verge of this thing that the way it is now, we we're just on the verge of um, big churches, a lot of people, big stages, smoke machines, flashy lights, all this kind of stuff. And there was one guy that was just, you know, he was like, man, we're going to change the world. We're go Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to do this and that and that. And, and uh, somebody, I was just young, but I mean, somebody asked me, well, what do you, you know, what do you think, Randy? And by the way, just don't ever ask me that unless you expect to hear, because I, you know, I'll usually give you one. I'll say, are you sure you want to know? Okay, I'm just letting you know. That, you know, and if you say yes, I will tell you. Okay, <clears throat> well, that was the case in this case. You know, well, what do you think, Randy? And I said, well, how did Jesus evangelize the world? I said, he just got 12 guys and he poured his life into them and that has spread all the way around the world. <laughs> I said, he didn't, he didn't have lights or smoke machines or, you know, I, he didn't, you know what I mean? I, you know, you said, well, he didn't have electricity or smoke machines, but he didn't have a campfire and a, you know, quilt or whatever. <laughs> you know, woohoo, come to see what's happening here. <clears throat> um, instead, it's like he kind of got out of the way, you know? I mean, he didn't even advertise his Bible school. You know, he didn't. He did, and he didn't beat a drum and he didn't say, hey man, if you want the truth, you come here. He was the truth and he just lived it. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Well, okay, so, you know, I'm reading that scripture, and I'm like 23 years old, I guess, at that time. And in a young man that's 23 years old, you wouldn't believe how much ambition, even if it's for the Lord, that you can have. You just want to, I mean, you want to change the world. And I mean, it's just pumping out of me. It's like, yeah, you know. And I read that scripture and I know this is the truth, but I, you know, I can't pay attention to that or we'll never get the work of God done. Mm -hmm. You know, so if nothing else in these last two classes, y'all have learned how pitiful a human being I am. But nonetheless, you know, uh, but I mean, I'm just telling you the truth. That was the way I thought. And it's like, man, I need to avoid these scriptures that talk about the cross. Because they're going to keep me from doing the work of God. I really did. It's like, okay, I'm only going to focus on the, the really ones that seem to be encouraging something powerful or whatever. Well, the Lord's faithful, isn't he? And the, and the Father is faithful because he, we have a Father. I, and, you know, those of you who know me, I didn't have a Father. So to have a Father was wonderful. And he fathered me and he... He would deal with me, and he slowly, because it wasn't he was slow, I was hard to get through, but he slowly began to, to break my heart and to melt my heart and to uh, deal with me in a way that I would read aright what the scriptures are saying and that I would see Jesus instead of me. And, um, and Philippians is just one of all the books. I mean, if you go through, if you just just took a quick little sampling of Philippians, what would you find? I mean, really, what, really? Okay, uh, as a Bible school director and teacher, I look out upon the students and I say, what is the book of Philippians about? And we go, well, you know, I don't know, or we go, well, I think it's about da da da, da. Well, it's about Jesus. And it's not just about Jesus, but it's about Christ and him crucified. And you say, well, where do you get that? Well, let's just take a quick sampling. In chapter 1, in verse 21, 
that says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, I think we dealt with that last, not the, the day, week ago, that we dealt with this a little bit. But this is Paul speaking, and he is preparing, uh, he's preparing them for the answer that he wants to give them. He is not saying, you know, he's not saying, okay, we got divisions in our church, and what we need to do is we need to, uh, he said, we need the mind of the crucified. Well, how many churches have you ever heard that from? I mean, let's just ask it like this. How many churches out there have problems between people in the churches, in their church? All of them. Okay. And, you know, I've been around a long time. I've heard every kind of answer you can imagine. When it doesn't matter what we think. The word of God is all that matters. And this is God's apostle, the one that he's got writing the Bible that would come down to all generations. And he's, and he's laying it out. Look, what we need is the mind of the crucified. What we need is instead of esteeming ourselves better and therefore, you know, you need to change. The old adage, you be the change. <laughs> instead of trying to change everybody else, you be the change. Well, I don't want to change. I shouldn't have to change. I'm right. Okay, well, you're not esteeming others better than yourself then, are you? You see what I mean? Well, you know, and then the answer can be, well, no, I'm not, because I don't have the mind of Christ. You know what I mean? I mean clearly, I don't, so we're going to do it my way. Well, <clears throat> I think that if the mind of Christ is not formed in us, we can still bow our knee before it. And just say, God, work that in me because I am, a, I am a wretch. And Paul said that of himself. Oh, wretched man that I am. So, so Paul is preparing them in chapter 1 because he knows what he has to deal with. And he's preparing them by saying, look, I just want you to know, you know, I'm the one that established this church, I mean, I'm talking for Paul here. You know, I'm the one who established this church. Maybe you don't remember, but me and, so, uh, me and Silas came here. Uh, it's been a few years back, and, and uh, we were preaching, and uh, there's, this, there's this lady named Lydia. She got saved, and, and she took us in, and the whole family got saved, and then we went back out on the streets, and, man, this place went nuts. You people are really, you believe anything about anybody, and you, will, you know what I'm saying? You'll, do, you'll just divide up and turn on one another at a, on a dime if you think that somebody else is wrong or bad or they're this or that. And he says, so, so you guys threw, you know, threw us in prison, you know, and, you, well, first you took us before the magistrate, and then you threw us in, in prison, and the jailer put us in the inner prison because he was told, you better, you know, these guys are bad, you know, these guys, are, you know. So we're being falsely accused, and we're being looked at not just as criminals, but the worst of criminals and stuff like that. So we just sit in there, me and Silas, and we just sing to the Lord, and we just we're just glad to be wherever God wants us, not just to in the in the in the blessings of God, but happy to be anywhere that He chooses. If that's God, if that's the will of God, if that's what God wants, I'm with the Lord. I'm not looking for a theological fix that benefits me and choosing that above the Lord. If that's if the cross is the Lord's will, I want it. If the lion's den is the Lord's will, I want it. If Joseph's pit or the, or the, the, the prison uh, that he was thrown into is the Lord's will, I just want to be with the Lord in it. So they're in it. They're in it just like Joseph. And they're singing. <laughs> and there's an earthquake. And the chains fall off and everything. And the jailer thinks everybody got up and ran out. And Paul and Silas are still sitting there. And he pulls out a knife and going to kill himself because the, ma the magistrate would kill him anyway because he didn't, you know, take care of the prisoners. And they said, no, no, hold it. And they go in, they lead, they lead their jailer, the one who threw him in prison. And, and you can be pretty sure that when they turned him over to him, he didn't go, oh, fellas, 
come on, we're going to go into the inner part, but, you know, there'll be Kool-Aid and cookies, and you know what I mean? I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure he'd chain him, he'd get in there, you know what I'm saying? And just show, and, and they go, you know, they didn't go, good, this guy's going to kill himself. You know what I'm saying? Because the way he treated us, we're Christians. We're of God. So, shh, don't say anything. He thinks we're gone. So, you know, let him do it. No, no, they, wait, no, no, we're here. And they happily share in the, in the lowest prison. They're doing the work of God. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Well, if that means, you know, falsely accused and thrown in prison and, and being pushed around by a mean jailer, I don't think that's what that means. Well, Paul does. You know, Paul does. That's what he thinks it means. That's exactly. Because the first century church understood this. This is only hard for us because we didn't get it this way from the beginning. No, I'm serious. I'm absolutely convinced. I mean, I've been at it long enough. I am convinced from what I've seen over and over in the scriptures, they weren't clouded with a lot of doctrines and religion and all this kind of stuff. They were just taught, look, you know, Jesus died and he saved us and then he came inside of us and he wants to live the same self-giving life that he did when he died on the cross. And that's your example. Look there. Let that mind be in you and let's go. You know, I mean, you know, simplified version, but I, I really believe that they were, that was what they understood to be the gospel. <clears throat> so Paul is expressing that to a city that is puffed up because they're a Roman city and they're turned on a dime and he's saying, look, I'm just, you know, he's saying, fellas, I just want you to know to me to live it's Christ, it's not me. To me, to live is Christ. He didn't say for, to, to me, to live Christian. That's what it's about. Let's live Christian. No. You know, uh, to me, we ought to follow Christian ethics. He didn't say that. It was much more intimate. It was much more real. It was not about any teaching or, 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 you know, more knowledge. It was a real person right now, right here. I love that. You know, when I tell you I love Jesus, I love Jesus wherever I can find him. In you, in anybody, in people that you would hate. If I sense Jesus in there, I love Jesus. And I'm going to love them. And I don't care what people think of me. I mean, you know, Doug was one of those that people just wanted to beat and make an outcast. I love that brother, and I see Jesus in him. And, you know, I wrap my arms around him and let people hit me, and they did, you know. Didn't bother me one bit. It was a privilege, you know, because I see Jesus. Well, I see Jesus in a lot of people, and if I see Jesus, you know, but if I see somebody that people are scraping and bowing to and it's just puffed up flesh, you're not going to get it. I will not respect it. I, it's not that I'll be mean or whatever, but I'm not going to go, that's Jesus. You know what I mean? I, you know, that's fine. Honor to whom honor is due, whatever that means in this situation. But my heart is, I'm looking for the Lord. <clears throat> so clearly this is what's at work in Paul. To me, to live as Christ and he's saying that because to you, this needs to be your mentality because shortly, very shortly, he's going to say, let this mind be in you. You see that? That's what he's working towards. Okay. And so then chapter 2, and we'll skip the part that we're mainly dealing with, but verse, uh, now we talked about some of this, <clears throat> verse uh, 15. Uh, Boy, this is just such great scriptures here. Um, verse 14, do all things without murmuring, murmurings and disputings. Okay, right there is enough to keep you busy. 
You know what I mean? I mean, that'll keep you busy the rest of your life. Um, why would we murmur? Why would we, why would we dispute with somebody? Because we don't like the way it's going down. And what does that mean? Well, it's not going down according to, let's see, my mind. Let this mind be in you. Okay. And he's already stated that now. He's already deeply into it. Remember, we're already past our verses 5 through 8. <laughs> we're down to verse 15. Let all things. So he's still dealing with the problem, isn't he? He's still dealing with the issue. He's still dealing with the Philippians or the Philippi mentality of turning on someone and false. If someone says something, believe in it immediately. <clears throat> he's saying, look, he's already shown you, number one, to me to live is Christ, and that should be yours. Number two, let this mind of Christ crucified be in you. Now he's, he's talking about how that practically works out. Um, and uh, verse uh, <clears throat> 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, children of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, didn't we just talk about that last week, about the light? And didn't, didn't Robert share on that Sunday morning? Walk as children of light. <clears throat> well, that spirit of selfless giving doesn't have to have its way. Okay, well, that's where we find a loophole. There's a loophole. There is. There's a loophole. Uh, okay, I'll admit it, Brother Randy, that I, I don't have to have my way, but I'm not trying to get my way. This is the Lord. We're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to go out and do so-and-so or witness, or we're supposed to, you know, whatever conflicts come in our mind. But we get around that real easy. We say, this is the Lord. <clears throat> but where it says, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, you should read all the scriptures around that one, too. It's the same deal. It's the same deal. You know, don't. Don't get in a big argument with your enemies. Don't, you know what I mean? Um, uh, you read it. It's powerful stuff. And, and you go, okay, is that Christian ethics then? Don't, you know, uh, do things without murmuring and without disputations. Uh, esteem others better than yourself. It's not. It's not Christian ethics. It's the mind of Christ in us, or it's not. Just a fact. It's either Christ or it's not. Well, I don't, my, me personally, I mean, somebody may feel conviction or something right now, or even condemned. I personally don't put that on people. I don't judge people. First of all, I don't know for sure what's working in everybody, you know. And I'm not saying, you know, that for you, I'm saying that's the truth. <laughs> now, before your own Lord, you rise or fall. See what I mean? My place is to just keep loving. Do you understand that? My place is to love you. I love you no matter what. In other words, what I'm trying to say is this is not Randy's agenda here. Clearly, it's in the Word of God, so it's God's agenda. It's Paul's agenda, and it's your agenda if you let. But if you don't, I'm going to love you. And, and you know what? If you end up abusing me or walking over me or something like that, I'm just going to keep on loving you, and that's the truth. Some of you have been around long enough to know I'm not going to. I don't change on that. I don't go, well, when, you, when you're doing good, I'm proud of you and I'm with you. But when you're not doing good, well, I, you know, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. No, I don't live that way. I just love you. And so don't ever think that you have to line up with what I'm sharing or that I'm putting expectations. I'm not putting expectations on you to do this. But the Lord might be. You may feel the presence of the Holy Spirit saying, okay, you need, to, you, need, you need this. You know what I'm saying? You need an adjustment or you need to move towards this or you need to be more open or 
or you need to not be so resistant. He may not even be telling you to be open, more open yet. He's just telling you not to be so <laughs> resistant. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like uh, more open might even be to move towards it. But he's just saying, look, just if you drop your concepts and everything and let me speak, then maybe I can work this in you instead of you trying to be this. See the difference? Christ. Christ in you. And that's what he's been saying. All right, so he's saying, you know, <clears throat> you know, do all things without murmuring and uh, uh, murmurings and disputations and that you may bl be blameless and harmless, the children of God, meaning of this same DNA, this same family. <clears throat> but guess what? Guess what? Guess what scriptures are right in front of this? Um, verse 13, we read 14, do all things without murmurings and disputes. Verse 13, for it is God who worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. All right. It didn't say it's God that does that. It says it's God in you. Can I get amen? All right. So Paul is convinced, Paul is convinced that the hope for the Philippian church and the hope for getting along has nothing to do with anybody's idea of a certain, well, let's do this or let's do that, that it is that they receive the mind of the crucified and that that be in them and it be Christ in them and it not just be them trying to find Christian ethics or trying to do the right thing or trying to please God so that he's not mad at me or whatever, but it is a genuine work of the Spirit to God be the glory. To God be the glory, damn. Well, that's what we want. That's what I, I bet you that's what Paul wants. I know that's what Jesus wants. It's what I want. You know, instead of people going down a road of freaking out and trying to do this, it is God at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, do all things with that. You see that? Right into the next. Yeah, no. Yeah. So this scripture says, for it is God at work in you. All right, see, we need to take our time to examine that. Which God is he talking about? The God of blessing, the God of prosperity, the God of, of miracles, the God of healing, the God of, well, he's already described in verses uh, 5 through 8, the God of the cross. You check it out. It's all flow. It's one flow. I'm not making that up. It's it, it, one verse flows into the other. <coughs> All right, let's move on because we're getting out of it. Okay, chapter 3 and verse um, 7 and 8. This is Paul speaking now. He's already painted a picture of Christ and the way that he is in relationship to the cross. Now he's going to paint a picture of himself and how he has let this mind be in him. But what things were gained to me... Those I count lost for Christ. All right, there you go. What was gained to me, I counted lost because I want Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Okay, so he's after Christ. Um, but when you drop down, um, what is it, verse 10 
He says, for the excellency, verse, uh, that last verse says, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I count the loss of all things, that I may win Christ, verse 10, that I may know him, this one. I'm, I want to know him. I want this excellent knowledge and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable to his death. I count loss, all these things, to conform to his self-giving nature. Okay. Now, see, I was, a, I was a hippie before I came to the Lord, and, you know, and so when you come to the Lord, it says, forsake all, and, you know, all was easy. It was fun. You know, it was just fun. You know, like, yay! <laughs> you know, it really was. This isn't fun unless it's Christ, and it's, then it's not fun, it's just Christ. There's no re reward to your soul. When I say your soul, I mean your soulish stuff. I'm not talking about benefiting your soul. <laughs> but your soulish um, synapses that keep you happy and responding because things are going the way you like it. Now, there's no reward to your soul in that manner. But you, but you, you count it all lost for Christ so that you can be made conformable to his death. Because you've seen something of the cross, but more than you've seen, and there's the kicker, it's more than you've seen something of, of the cross, you've seen that that's supposed to be in you. That that beautiful Jesus, can I put it like that? That beautiful Jesus is supposed to live just that same way in you. I like that. It's not easy, but I like it. Yes, sir. Well, that's what Paul sees as the prize. Yeah, right and it goes on into that, yeah. All right, I need to, we're probably getting low on time here. Chapter 4 and verse 11. <clears throat> Not that I speak uh, in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am in this to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full, to be hungry, and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, there's one of those again. There's one of those again. That verse has been perverted out the kazoo. What happens? We just read the context, folks, and the context is not that I can do all things through Christ. I can, uh, I can uh, get out of trouble. I can, get, I can be blessed. I can uh, succeed. I can be happy. I can do all things through. Look at what we just read. He says, look, I, I've learned to be crucified or exalted, but I do it all by Christ. I, whether a base or a bound. Whether, if, if, again, if, because the Lord's not going to just bless everything you do. He wants to know if you're with him. Are you of his kind? Are you after his kind? Are you of the same heart? Or are you just, a, you know, I mean, we talk about being the body of Christ. But folks, the body of Christ is one with Christ. And it responds to the mind. The mind, remember, it responds to the mind. And... <clears throat> You know, and the only thing, folks, that, that, that can be attached like that but still not respond is a parasite. Oh, I'm sure everybody loves me. <laughs> but I mean, you know, a parasite can attach and look, you know, walk out part of the body. I'm, I'm drawn from Jesus. <laughs> you know, I'm sucking blood out of him, but nonetheless, <clears throat> you know, I'm. Uh, see, I'm right here with the rest of the members. I'm the, I'm just the slimy one. <laughs> but I'm still attached to the body, you know. Well, you know what the the difference of being a body member and a leech is oneness of spirit and oneness of being. Are you a, the, that being, or are you a different being that's attached and claiming? And even being able to draw some out of him, 
but it's only for your you know, survival and everything instead of for his glory. <clears throat> so, you know, Paul is, is just bragging. He's just bragging. He's going, man, I've learned. And see, he didn't say this came automatically once I got saved. <laughs> that I've learned to be exalted or abased, whatever, in whatever state I find myself. As soon as I got saved, I was happy with it. No. And it's even worse today because everyone is fed the line that everything's going to just work out and be wonderful and things. And that, you know, well, if you're suffering, then that's not of the Lord. What? You know, I, well, let me just, <clears throat> let, let me, just, you know, I always have to, to clarify all this stuff because, you know, that can be taken wrong. I am not supporting the thought of, well, suffering is just what, you know, what we all ought to be doing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being with Christ and in his heart, <clears throat> he will suffer. He will, he will put others first. I mean, you know, the example I think of is, is uh, Jesus in the uh, book of Revelation. He's in the midst of the candlesticks, which represent the churches. Seven candlesticks, seven number completion represents the churches. Then it says that it does. <clears throat> um, he's, he's in the midst, but then you go a few chapters over and he's outside of the church. And it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Well, there's another, sorry, a perverted scripture. We, we take that for salvation. Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart to ask him to come in. That's not the context of that. That's not the meaning of that. He's knocking on your heart, church, to trying to get back in and live his life in you instead of you living for him. You know, but we don't read the context. We find one scripture and we go, oh, this, this sounds good. You know what? Doesn't matter if it sounds good. Is it God? Is this, is this the word of God or are we perverting the word of God? And, and so in that picture, I see, I see Jesus, you know, I, I, you know I, being from Oak Cliff, which is rough, really rough part of town of Dallas, really rough. <clears throat> you know, if I'm Jesus and I'm, and I'm supposed to be on the inside and in the midst and center and they end up having me outside and then looking to me for their help. And I know that my place is on the inside. Well, I pull, a, I pull an old clip. I walk up to the door and bam, you know, kick it open and go back in and say, you people, this is, you know, that's why you do it in Oak Cliff. But Jesus, he's just standing at the door knocking and hoping that we'll go, you know what? Let's let this Christ in you thing happen with us. Let's let it be Christ in us and not just us anymore. Let's go with that. Who knows how long he stood there and knocked? <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's his, that's his way because he minds not high things but condescends to men of low estate because he doesn't seek the higher seat. He'll take the lower seat. These aren't teachings. This is who he is. <laughs> I mean, they really are. The, the, if they're teaching, they're only fulfilled by Christ in you. <laughs> okay. So, but, but you can fulfill the teaching without pursuing the teaching. Just make your focus Christ in you instead of yourself. That's, that's the key. <clears throat> but I, you know, I see him, I see him standing there and he's being abased. He's not being given his rightful position. He's not being honored. And then I see the example in, and I'll finish with this, but I see the example in the Old Testament when, when Solomon finally built the temple, the most grand example of the church, the body of Christ, Solomon's temple. <clears throat> Way better than David's tabernacle in the sense for, of really representing the full body of Christ, uh, better than the tabernacle of Moses. This is it. This is the temple that God gave the blueprint to David, and David gave it to Solomon, and it got built. So the ark has been, you know, not inside of there. And so the scriptures talk about, and when the, when the priests brought in the ark and set it in his place, because the ark represents Christ. It, it represents the presence of God. Sets it in his place. Then the glory came down. 
And the ministers fell to the ground, and they could not minister by reason of the, the glory. Okay, so, you know, so what do we... What do we squeeze out of that? What the heck do we squeeze out of that? Well, we squeeze, well, well, you know, it also mentioned the trumpeters and when they were singing, folks, it's not, you know, it's like, okay, praise and worship is greater than Christ being put in us in taking his place and really being, filling the temple. You know, they, we went, oh, praise you, praise you. And I'm not, I'm just saying, you know, we've got a wrong idea. That's, that's great. That's wonderful. But it doesn't replace Christ in his place. And then we say, well, you know, the glory fell. It was, it's all about the glory. We need the glory. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what are we going to do? Oh, God, send down your glory. No, how about, oh, church, let Christ in. He's not going to get back in. <laughs> you know? You know, he, he's, you, the church has put him outside of us and then they, they crawl, cry out to one way far away and they're not living by Christ. And Paul said to, you know, for to me to live is Christ. Let this mind be in you. So we see the result and we start, we start praying and seeking for the result of something. Again, it would be like, oh, Lord, we're in darkness. The church is in darkness, you know. Lord, you know, send the light instead. And he's saying, just go over here and flip the switch, and you won't be in darkness anymore. Just put Jesus in his place, and the glory will fall. But if you don't do that, there's not going to be any glory. I'm not going to glorify something that is, is just you guys, you know what I mean? And the reason why they couldn't minister is because Jesus is finally in the center. He's finally the one who's supposed to live. He's finally taken over. And then we go, well, well, we can't even minister anymore. Or do we say, thank God it's Christ now. And there's rest. So I can do all things. I can be abased. I can have people talk bad about me, think bad about me, <clears throat> and still love them. And not only love them, I really love them, you know, um, and realize, you know, maybe they need to go through this. You know, maybe they need, I'll just tell you some of my thoughts at times. Maybe they need a whipping boy, and Lord, may it not be somebody who can't handle this. I mean, I could pray it away. I'm the son of God, I'll pray it away. Well, wait a minute. These people have a they're messed up on the inside and they're looking for a scapegoat somewhere so you know let it fall on somebody else I'm okay because I'm mature and I know how to cover myself see that's not you know the example I use on that is you know we we say okay well we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pray for our city and we're gonna get all the demons out so we all start praying say oh lord you know Demons, we cast you out of our city. We cast you from here. You know, well, you know, they go somewhere. So they go over to a city over here. You know what I mean? So we go, well, praise God. We don't have any anymore. Really, is that the spirit of Christ? I'm just, I'm just asking you. I'm just asking you. I'm not, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying I got a weird mind. And I admit it. But... But when that was, you know, trying to happen, transpire around me, I was kind of going, you know what? Our church, we can handle this. We can live Christ even with demons all around. Jesus did. He didn't, you know, he didn't go, oh, there's a demon in somebody over there. We need to get him out of this city. Walked up and said, you know. But you know what I mean? He wasn't afraid and he wasn't worried about it. He wasn't personally. He wasn't constantly reacting. Well, we're the body of Christ. You know what I'm saying? We're the body of Christ. And as such, I don't, I mean, we go down to Mardi Gras and, you know, some people, Kelly was one of them in the early days, my God, the demons and junk down there is just like, ah, you know, and I'm just going, hey, <laughs> I was raised in hell, you know, <laughs> this ain't nothing. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you, you, you begin to realize we can, I'm just using that example of casting them out to another city. Maybe they can't handle them. We're more mature. Let's just ask, let's invite theirs over here. 
I know I'm not saying that I, I'm not saying that's what we're supposed to do, but I am saying can you hear can you hear a principle at work here that you know, do we really think Jesus just wants to cast them all on everybody else? You know, Jesus took all that. He went down into hell. He, he suffered. He, he didn't put it on everybody else. He said, bring it on. And then he took it down into death and defeated not just demons here and there and there and there. He defeated the whole thing. Because the cross is more powerful than all of the authority to cast out a demon that you'll ever find. So, so that was my thought when, when uh, someone, I, I, I walked out of the church one Sunday morning and a person jumped on me like a chicken on a June bug, man, and they just went, what, you did this and da 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 and you were a terrible pastor and all this stuff and da 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 and they walked off and there were a bunch of, I mean, the people were coming out of the church building. Some of y'all might have even been there. <clears throat> right in front of everybody. And then walked off, and he was a church member. I thought about it for a second, and somebody came up to me and said, man, what, what are you going to do about that? And I said, nothing. I said, they clearly have got a, a problem and a situation working in them, and they need, and it wasn't, you know, it, in that case, it wasn't something I had done. They were just upset, you know. It's like somebody getting run over by the boss at work and coming home and kicking the cat. You know, the cat goes, oh, Duffy, you know. <clears throat> that person just had, had a burr under their saddle, and that was it. And uh, they needed somebody to unload on, and they unloaded on me. And I said, you know what? I can handle this in the Lord. I love them. Nothing in my heart has changed for them, nor will change for them. And so this is good. This is, uh, you know, as a pastor, I'm thinking, I would rather this have happened to me than somebody in the church. You know what I mean? Who could be devastated. I can be abased. I can abound. I mean, if, you know, it, it just, the Lord knows. That's why we call him Lord. He knows the situations. And if he's ordered that, then I'm with him. But I'm only with him because it is his life. You understand what I mean? I mean, we're only with him because it's him. We can try to be with him, and we'll still get, you know, upset over stuff. But even if Christ has not yet fully been formed in us in this way, Christ is in us. And you can rest on that. Just don't get passive in there. Just keep saying, Father, I want your son formed in me. You know. Amen? Amen? Father, we just thank you for your spirit that is ever present and ever wanting to lift up Christ in our midst. We thank you that you, you are speaking to us. You're speaking by your word. You're speaking, Holy Spirit, to hearts. You're speaking to them because they love, love, your, love Jesus. And you found ears that want to hear. So, Father, we ask for grace and patience as you finish the work that you've started in us. And in the meantime, we press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, we're dismissed. <laughs>